Well, let's get more on this now with Jonathan Sashadotti, a Middle East analyst. Uh, Jonathan, this is being seen as a referendum on his personality and his politics. Do you think that he can do it? Do you think he could swing a third consecutive term? With around 20% of voters still saying they're undecided, that's exactly what Benjamin Netanyahu is hoping for. He believes that his strong reputation and history of looking after the country's security and prioritizing those issues in election campaigning will convince his core voter base to vote for him in the end. But of course, some are saying that over the course of the election campaign, really he lost ground to the other parties who emphasized those social and economic issues, which more and more Israelis are voting for, like other regular OECD countries. In a way, this uh, election marks a bit of a shift. It's a confirmation of the shift we saw in the last Israeli elections uh, from voting on purely security and uh, foreign policy issues to voting more on the domestic issues that affect people's day-to-day -day lives. Do you think Israelis are voting on him or do you think they're voting on Likud? I think uh, there has been a lot of analysis saying that actually a lot of Israelis like the policies that Likud stand for, but perhaps not with Netanyahu at the head. There's certainly a feeling among many that there should be a change, let's say, but that happens in any election in any country. I mean, we're having the same sorts of discussions right here in Great Britain. Uh, the election system in Israel is quite different to the one that we have in the United Kingdom and, in fact, different to many across the world because you are voting for somebody who will essentially build a coalition rather than a first-past-the-post system where you're more likely to have one party dominating the government. And as you were discussing there in your report, what is also likely is that Benjamin Netanyahu who stands still quite a high chance, even if the polls are right and he loses by a couple of seats, he may in fact still be able to form a coalition with other parties. Uh, he may in fact see that Isaac Herzog, who's drawing ahead in the last polls before they were stopped in advance of the actual election period, the week run-up, uh, he's been taking votes away more from merits, which is actually part of the left-wing bloc that he's part of. So in a way, there's all to play for still, and the interesting part of the campaign happens after the votes are cast and counted, when you start to see the deals being made between the different parties to see who can form a strong government. And there are very many options there to see how Israel will be governed over the coming years. And a great deal of responsibility uh, on the shoulders of the Israeli president as well to decide how that government should be formed. That's right. And the president has, for example, uh, Reuven Rivlin has explained that he would in some ways favor a unity government uh, whereby there could be actually a, a joint left-right ticket so that there is some sort of balance of those two parties, or rather those two main blocks in government. But it could go any way. You could see Netanyahu forming a government, shoring it up with more religious and more right-wing parties who hold the balance of power. Or you could see uh, the balance of power held by people like Yair Lapid, who did very well in the last election, expected to do less well in this election, but still to be a kingmaker in some respects, uh, in the sense of who he decides to join in a coalition. So there's really all to play for. What people care about in Israel, it seems, as well as security, as we've been talking about in that report, is the economy, and that could be the thing that possibly unseats Netanyahu. But what the rest of the world care about is the peace process in that part of the world. If, if Netanyahu doesn't get in again, this will breathe new life into that floundering peace process, won't it? It might breed new life into the process, as you heard in the report uh, that you played just a moment ago. The left-wing bloc is saying that they will try and revitalize that negotiation uh, system, but I'm not sure there's actually a great chance of much changing. I think one of the reasons that the Israeli electorate has shifted so much to dealing with economic, social policy issues, domestic issues, is that actually the general actions of the Palestinians over recent years has shown that they feel, the Israeli population feels, more and more disenchanted with the idea of reconciliation and negotiation, with the Palestinians pursuing disagreement at more levels on the international stage rather than actual negotiation and reconciliation. I think most people have just decided that it's an impossibility, even with a left-wing government in place who might pursue that, very unlikely that anything will happen. They feel, in a sense, there isn't a partner for peace, so they can concentrate instead on trying to improve the economic uh, stability of the country, their day-to-day -day lives, and seeing some of that growth which Israel has experienced, roughly 4% year on year, at quite difficult economic times, trying to see more of that trickle down to the ordinary person's pocket. Okay. Jonathan Sashadotti, thanks very much for joining us.